always start, always lead off with somebody who plays better than you. <laughs> so that's why we got Tim up there. Hey, everybody. Thanks for turning out. What software am I using? I'm using, I went to move to StreamYard so that I could do a live stream for my patrons that I did last week um, where I wanted to bring a guest. I had Zach Childs on there. That was my uh, my maiden voyage on this software. There's a lot of things it doesn't do that the old stuff uses that OBS does that I like better. Um, but this is makes um, it makes doing this uh, a lot easier. That's a lot easier. Uh, and it makes um, bringing in guests absolutely the easy way to go. Um, it's great. We got a big contingent of people from Canada. It must be the cold weather has everybody forced indoors like it has forced me indoors here. Uh, I was in the chat earlier and it's about 12 degrees here. Um, <laughs> that philosopher is in, in uh, uh, Japan up early and he's saying he's already feeling the pain of the slow mode. I, uh, I don't know how many people are going to show up here, man. So I put it at 90 seconds. So you can put a little timer on your iWatch and it's a 90 second delay today. Um, and uh, I'll see how if I can keep up. All right, so this is the uh, overdue uh, live stream for uh, a follow-up to the Beatles Get Back. Um, I want to thank first um, Tim for playing on that. Really incredible job that he did there. Um, that was him on the intro, of course, and uh, the Beatles-y music he wrote for the guitars at the Get Back video. Uh, I want to thank Bebe. Uh, we're going to do a little, a little computer moment here. There you go. This is the image that Bebe is willing to share with the world. Uh, that's that's my buddy Bebe. He's uh, he's moderating for us today from Switzerland. I don't think I heard from Bebe about what the weather is there. Bebe, can you tell us what the temp is? Uh oh, I can't can't get back. There we go. I'm back. Um, so maybe Bebe will throw that up in the comments. Uh, I'd be curious to know. Greetings from ATL. I talked to Rick this morning, uh, like usual, and uh, he said it's uh, it's pretty cold, uh, pretty cold there. So Fern Cardenas says it's 77 degrees. Where, where are you, Fern? 77 degrees, man. Uh, so yeah, yeah, definitely jump in there and um, and tell us where you're calling in from, where you're dialing in from. Dialing in, see, shows my, shows my age. Um, so I need to thank the Indomitable Baby Ninja for moderating for us today all the way from Switzerland. As always, you might be able to stump me with a gear question on here, but I have yet to stump Bebe. Uh, and I asked him earlier if he knew more about the Beatles than me, which wouldn't be necessarily tough. Um, as I said, this is the long overdue live stream to talk about making of Get Back, the Get Back video. Uh, after we go through, I've got notes here, obviously. Uh, after we go through uh, a few things I wanted to tidy up, uh, we'll be ready for regular questions like always. Glad to answer anything I can. I do have a surprise guest today. Maybe not such a big surprise, but um, I have a guest here uh, that's going to, he's got him, he's waiting in the green room doing his, uh, doing his, his uh, endless email on his phone. I can see him. <laughs> he's laughing at me. Um, so um, we'll have him here today too. Uh, I've got a guest, as I said, this is the first time on the main channel that I've had a guest. So it's first time for everything. So hang in if we have any um, technical, uh, I'm sure that he will be glad to answer any questions he can too. Uh, so first off, uh, I am not, I repeat not, a Beatles expert. I can do research as well as the next guy, but, um, and Andy Bubiak, the man who wrote the seminal Beatles, Ge Beatles gear, was my guitar salesman at the House of Guitars when I was a teenager, but I am not him. Though I did steal a number of guitar lessons from him by talking him into demoing guitars for me that I couldn't afford back in the 70s. Um, and then a couple of things from the comments. Uh, I missed a couple of instruments that went by really quickly. And I will say, in my own defense, um, I have to say that, that I, I loved watching Get Back, but at the same time, it made me really uncomfortable. I'm, from a, I'm like a middle child from a family of five. And so when things are tense, uh, in a room, I I'm always trying to make it better. You know, I like go get the guitar, you know, try to calm everybody down. That's me. So um, the tension in the room with the Beatles was pretty palpable and pretty hard for me to watch, honestly. Um, somebody told me, maybe it was maybe it was Tim, who told me that Howard here on an interview that Howard Stern said that he thought it was the best documentary and the worst that was ever made because it was hard to watch at times. And you you go through these long stretches where it was difficult to, to watch. And then, you know, all the silliness and, you know, the cameras would be running and the, the tape would be running. And then they would turn to Glenn Johns in that ridiculous shearling, you know, um, lambswool coat. And then they would cut the take that was on the record. And you're just kind of like a tear would come to your eye. You're just like, I can't believe that I'm watching that actually happen on screen. 
Um, but there probably were times when I looked away. So uh, the first one I missed was actually, I remember seeing it, but then it didn't stick in my head. And it was the Fender Acoustic that the, makes an appearance in the first episode out at Twickenham Studios. Uh, we never see it again. And I was left to assume that um, that guitar probably never saw the light of day again in a Beatles hands. Um, and uh, so that one got missed. It was, I think it was an all blonde, you know, like a maple uh, guitar and it had, you know, a big uh, late sixties Stratocaster style headstock on it. Pretty, pretty weird guitar. Um, I also understand from the comments that I missed the appearance of a left-handed jazz bass headstock in like two frames. And for that, I apologize. I do think that uh, a left-handed jazz bass was forthcoming uh, to Paul at around that time from the boys at Fender. Um, but like I said, I think my attention wandered very slightly. Uh, I will tell you that I was originally going to try to do all the instruments. And when I was watching the video, I, I took all these notes, copious notes throughout, thinking that I was going to do all of the instruments. And I even wrote the script. And I I quickly realized that it was about twice the size of anything else I'd ever done. And I really needed to get it out and then get on with my holiday. So I fell back to doing just the guitars. I mean, I was gonna do the keyboards, uh, the PA gear, everything. Um, and I'd be interested here to hear from anybody here who knows you know, where the anvil that was used on Maxwell's silver hammer came from. That was gonna be like my little pet project to try to figure that out where it is now. Um, I also plan to do a short history on the Fender Rhodes piano this year. That's a great story. Uh, Fender Rhodes piano was actually developed um, by a doctor during World War II to help uh, rehabilitate guys who were wounded, both psychologically and physically, to teach them how to play piano. They did, had to, he had to invent a piano that could be rolled over their hospital bed. I never knew any of that stuff until I started reading about roads last year when I wanted to start thinking about doing this. And actually, there's a great documentary called Down the Roads uh, that was put out because I actually and I'll, I'll definitely talk about Get Back again, because I think all of us probably felt when Billy Preston showed up on the scene um, that that the whole thing just got better. It, it was he was like the glue that made the whole session work. Uh, my favorite moment was when somebody, you know, in a big Liverpool accent said something about writing out the chords for him. And Billy very calmly said, um, I, I did, go ahead. I, I think I, I think I got this. And uh, he had it. So it was good. Um, let's see. Uh, also, this this was just the guitars and get back. This is not like all the Beatles guitars. I mean, the Bobiak book that's right here is about, you know, an inch and a half thick. Um, I am actually working on a short history of Gibson jumbos and I, I am touching on the, uh, Gibson jumbos that George Harrison, uh, George Harrison and John Lennon had the Gibson 160 J 160 E that's the slope shoulder guitar with the pickup right at the end of the neck. Um, and that's a great story. Um, by all accounts, they were trying to order, they went to the store and they thought they were ordering Gibson 175s. And um, they said they wanted the great big jumbo electric um, Gibson guitars, and they ordered those. The two guitars actually left the factory the same day. I think it was June 27th, 1962. I mean, I'm neck deep in the edit right now, so I think that's what it was. So I'll be talking about that in the video that's going to come out later in the week. Uh, I think that's about that. Uh, I am smart enough um, to uh, get through these things. And uh, I'm also smart enough to talk my friends into helping me out on these kinds of projects. Um, and um, though Tim has also reassured me he is not a Beatles authority, he has spent a lifetime in the studio playing some of the guitars that they played. And Tim has graciously agreed to make an appearance here today. He is our guest. I'm going to see if I can bring him in. And uh, he's looking up. So I think he knows I'm here. I'm asking for him. Here we go. There he is. Hey, Keith. Hey, everybody. I'm actually looking at the chat yes. on my phone because the chat doesn't appear in my StreamYard feed. I'm going to... what. What you'll get is I'll pull the questions up and I think you'll be able to see it if I do. Well, it's like all this. good because I have multiple screens and I'm addicted to all of them. So it's I'm in the world I'm so, always in. I, I just wanted to kind of get a feel for everybody and what everybody was talking about. And it's it's just great to see everybody. And yes, this is this is something I got surprised by. We, you know, we have our mutual friend Rick, and Rick said, you need to do a video on the Beatles gear. And we nobody likes to say no to Rick. So I said, okay. <laughs> and what happened was absolutely magical. Uh, I have a friend who's worked at Fender for 35 years. And, well, no, wait. I have a friend I've known for 35 years who's worked at Fender for probably 15 years. And okay. 
uh, his name's Joey Grassler. And he, he, I called him and I said, hey, uh, have you got anything, you know, that, about the, you know, that I could use for this Beatles video? And he said, oh, we have, now this is privileged information here. <laughs> Wait, we have, wait, wait, wait. Before you say this, you, you're going to get me in trouble with Fender. I, I can't have that. I'm not a big guy like you. I can't. I can't. Okay, then I won't reveal Fender. anything, but <laughs> we have something for you. That's all I'll reveal. Okay, thanks, Keith. You kept me out of trouble, too. That was subtly done. That was subtly yeah, done. So, so he he drove across town that night in the dark. Wait, he, he, he brought you the guitar? And I said, I'll go pick it up if you want. And he said, no, 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 no. Wow. And he drove across town and I went to his house, which is near me, and I picked up this guitar. And I wasn't expecting anything, but I was just blown away by how great it sounds. And I saw somebody in the chat mention uh, on how <clears throat> George's version of this was gloss. All right. Yeah. You know, Fender is really, really smart because they it's this is an updated version and there's some things about it that are are frankly better. Um and two of the things that I think are better, one, it's weight relief, and that makes it really I mean, it's still it's still eight and a half pounds. It's definitely got weight to it. Yeah, yeah. But I think you know, from what I understand, those rosewood tellies were like 13 pounds, so they were that's not a workable thing for me. Uh, I, it can't be that heavy. A guitar can't be that heavy. And then the other thing about this, it has a very modern open pour finish. And I'm telling you, this is the most satisfying thing <laughs> to actually feel and touch and have in your hands. I mean, yeah, one I of the just, reasons I would just sit around and polish that all day. Uh, I, it's I just shit done. Yeah. No, it's just so satisfying, the feel of it. And then I was... I'm really blown away by how good it sounded. I never expected it to sound good, but when I listened to the track that you and I did, that the thing that, that you asked me to do, I really am pleased with the way it sounds. It doesn't sound harsh at all. Yeah. It's It's got really nice top end. It has a richness to it that I didn't expect. And of course I'm using the neck pickup most of the time, but even when I go to the bridge, There's something smooth and warm about it. And yeah. what else can you ask for in a telly? You don't have, and you don't have the tone rolled off at all. That's oh, wide no. open. Wide open. Then the middle pickup. I mean, to, uh, even right here, right now, I'm going, this thing sounds great. And then there's the neck. So I really lucked out with this. And then. I didn't know if I was going to be able to keep this guitar, but because the video I did did well, as did all of ours, because of the, you know, the environment, mm -hmm. um, I said, please, 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 can I have this guitar? And they were kind enough to give it to me. So I'm going to take it to a, a, a friend of mine who's a uh, Mark Van Gool, who's the guitar setup guy to the stars. And I'm going to have him just set it up to where I can, you know, I can really play. So practically yeah. play play itself because the, the the strings are a bit heavy and the action's a bit high which most players like but i love my guitars to be just dead easy to you know i was going to say you're a low you're a, you're like me you're like a, a low okay. a low guy right and and you yeah. play uh you're going to put nines on it or tens or what do you think i put nines it's got it's got nines. tens on it i'm going to put nines and okay. then i'm going to have to lower the action and do whatever it takes to make it perfect and so because but i couldn't do that until it was officially my guitar so sure that's great congratulations uh, this will be uh, available again. That's what I'll say. So it's, you know, <laughs> ask the question, will it be available? It'll be available again. So that's great. I vouch for it. I really love it. Now, uh, if you don't mind me talking some more. No, no. Uh, and, and I was, I'm, I was going to do your segue for you. And the casino. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I have a dear friend named Kim Bullard and he plays keyboards with Elton John. He's about to go back on the road with Elton. And he, uh, Got this guitar from another Beatles friend of ours, Julian Raymond, who's a big producer in Nashville. And Julian this, got this him. This puppy is an actual vintage. It's a 1962 62. casino. Wow. Now, you might not believe it because of the condition, but if you look, if you were in the room with me, you would see the cracks and the blemishes yeah. and edge yeah. to yeah. it. But yeah. yeah, this is, this is, uh, it belongs to my friend Kim. And I'm hoping that I can buy it from him. But here's the situation. Well, we're all I behind you. Want, I, I want the value to go down. <laughs> <first>. <laughs> you should have bought it. 
You should have bought it last summer. <laughs> no, yeah, he wouldn't. There's no way. It's a, it's a. Fa I have to wait. This is a family guitar. He and his daughter have used this guitar to write songs oh. for a long, long time, <laughs> and it's absolutely magical. The thing about a casino is that because oh, and and what's great is and I sh I put flat wounds on this thing. Yeah, I, I I had like one pair of flat pair. Yeah, <laughs> one set, just two. one set of flat, flat wounds. Yeah, there you go. And let's see, let's, it's just with flat wounds. It sounds exactly the way it's supposed to. That's great. That's great. This sounds radically different. You you actually, this is actually a good point to talk about. And I noticed this when I would play the two guitars. You actually have to set the amp radically different with this guitar. Uh, they're like in different frequencies entirely. This one has so much more bottom end. Yeah, well, flats, flats have um, quite a bit more tension. Is that right? Yeah, they. Yeah, I feel. I feel it. Flats are the same size because I used to run. I had a straight ahead jazz gig. It was a weekly, and I played it for five years. And I started playing it with. I had a Fender Diaquisto, which was a pain because it wanted to feed back if I moved and stuff. Eventually, I ended up playing four years of that gig on a Parker, with flat wound Diodario Chrome tens. And what you wow. learn is a couple of things. A, no one, but no one, even the guitar players in the room, don't really care what you're playing as long as you can play something. And the other thing was I, I had to have the guitar re reset, set up again when I went from 10 round wounds to 10 flats because it it, it just had much so much more tension. It was different on the neck. So I, I feel that, yeah, I, we did, in the early 2000s, there was this big trend in LA. There were so many television shows that we had to make sound alikes for. And I realized we were making all these early 60s songs sound like the originals. And the reason I was having trouble getting the tones is because I wasn't using flat wound. So it really, it's it's like there's that. It's like yeah. a flack or a, a clack that's just yeah. Yeah, there's an attack. The attack is completely different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's really yeah. on this guitar. It's really wonderful. But the magical thing about this is there's no bracing, yeah. and so it's light as a feather. And I mean, it's really it's magical for. Oh, I should tune before I do that, but for the kind of the kind of like when you want a, an electric guitar to to play the role of an acoustic, yeah, Take it's there's nothing better than this guitar, and that's a very important thing sometimes in a song. You know, like a band like the Counting Crows, every song they had was. There's not a lot of guitars that are good at this particular thing. Now, this guitar is good at a lot of things, but one of the things it's really great at is in a track, playing the kind of part that you were playing on acoustic. So, yeah, you can use, yeah. which is which is what they did a lot. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Which they they yeah. did a lot. So you, you've provoked me. You 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 entertain them. I'm going to get mine. Oh, okay, good, good. Right. Yeah. So this is identical to a Gibson 330. Now, challenge me on that if you disagree, but I've owned a Gibson 330, uh, at least one in my life, and it's basically the same guitar. So I think it's, for the purpose of value, I think you could go out and find a 330. It would look identical to this except for the headstock, and you'd essentially would have the same sound. Now, if, if, if I'm wrong about that, let me know, but that's my theory anyway, because it's the same thing, no bracing. Well, yeah. that is gorgeous. So this this is the only besides the Strandberg. This is the only other electric I kept. Um, it's a 2013 ES390, um, and this and it have as it has flats on it. The interesting the reason I went to get it was I put flats on it because um, Jonathan Cordy is a channel that I watch all the time, and I'm really inspired by John's jazz playing, um, and and even just the way he approaches blues. So I'm kind of like moving back towards a Strat, but it, it also made me want to go play standards again. And so I was like, I'm going to put flats on this. So I put flats on it, not even realizing that it would also then fill in as my Gretsch, which I don't have anymore, and fill in as a, like a casino. Because this, I put the flats on like over a year ago, probably even before I knew Get Back was coming out. Um, so this is the full on, you know, flamey one. The funny thing was I ordered, I think I've told this story on my, I have a video about it. Um, I ordered three of these, two from Wildwood that were like, you know, pristine and one from Z sounds or someplace in New Jersey where, 
you you never know what you're going to get because they don't even show you pictures of the actual guitar and the, and it was a blem and i was like uh, what's that going to be right so when i get the guitar it has a big smudge down here it's not there now because adam buckwall from circle strings he i showed it to him he's like uh do you mind if i just hit it with the buffer he's like Phew. and all of a sudden it's shinier than the top you know so it's so i got it for about a grand off um but it was still oh, an, it's still the most expensive electric i ever bought I'm but, glad you still have it. It's gorgeous. And you it's need an amazing it. guitar. There's actually a guy, a couple of people that are in my friends of Fry Black group that tell me that if I ever go to sell this, if they see it listed on Reverb, they're going to stage an intervention and drive out to my house. So, Okay. Well, I'll join that group, Keith. <laughs> I, it, did, it did scare me when you sold all that gear. Uh, so I've got to- no, I didn't sell this one. I didn't sell it. <laughs> it's a nice guitar. I've got to be informed probably. about future sales so I can talk you down. If, if That's if, probably if, radically out of tune. Yeah. Oh, it's horrific. horrific. Yeah. So, yeah, it hasn't been out of the. Yeah. Case. So anyway, I think I think a Gibson three thirty would give you this sound. Uh, but this is a real sixty two. Now I had a later sixties Epiphone Casino that sounded pretty good, but it had the thin neck. You know how the the the, the Gibson and the Epiphone necks got thinner later right. in the sixties, yep. and that's really hard for me because my fingers are little fat sausages. Me too. So, same yeah, thing. so if I go down to this first position and it's one of the thin neck late 60s Gibsons, I don't feel great about it. And I really have tried to make those guitars work, but I I couldn't. So that casino, which yep. was, it was red and it had the vibrato mm. thing. It was so cool. I actually traded it to Norm at a pretty low cost for something else because I lived with it for a few years and it wasn't the right one. This is a different world, the wider neck early 60s casino now kim told me and you might be able to verify this that they actually the beatles there were times on stage when all three of them were playing casinos is that possible no because paul would no, it, well paul bought his first so right it is it right. is possible yeah, yeah. and, and then over. i've seen i saw i just saw a picture this morning of john lennon with this exact color yeah but yeah this is a 62 it's it really is a holy grail guitar Right. It yeah, may be too expensive for me to buy when the time comes, and I may yeah. not, not have the opportunity to buy it until this may go, you know, this may stay in Kim's family. I'm not <laughs> sure. But he's my neighbor, and he's leaving it here, and I get to use it, so it's really fun. <laughs> and it's famous. It's crazy famous now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, the terrible thing is that the 390s, the year, they only made them for two years, and then the second year, they, they did a very short run of them with, with uh, P90, dog ear P90 pickups. Wow. And so every time I see one, I'm I'm terribly tempted. So uh, does the 330 have a center block? No, Jim, the 330 no. doesn't. It's a fully hollow guitar and the casino is yeah. the same. Um, just to remind everybody, the casinos were made in the late 60s on the same line at Kalamazoo at the factory, at the Gibson factory, because they had bought Epiphone in 1958 and they were still integrating the companies together, trying to figure out where they belonged. Um, I, I read a quote that said something to the effect that Ted McCarty wanted uh, I think I said in the video that Ted McCarty wanted them to be almost as good as the Gibsons and they wanted to keep it. And then over time, of course, they made the lines more and more. Um, they made a greater and greater disparity between the two. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, you know, like, um, well, Robin Ford has, is it a Riviera? Is that the model mm -hmm. where it does have a center block and Robin has one and it used to have a tailpiece on it. And then he had um, uh, the, the master guy down in uh, Nashville. He actually yeah, had, him. yeah. We can't think of his name right now. Yeah, right? yeah, that's right. terrible. Yes, yeah. uh, Joe Glazer had that's had it. Glazer put a stop tailpiece on it, and he used the same measurements as on um, Larry Carlton's guitar, on purpose, because right. where the tailpiece is is not that standardized from guitar to guitar, especially in those years. And so he was looking to, you know, he had toured with uh, Larry, and he wanted to get that, so he had Glazer do it that way. So before I forget, we have Brian Ewald here. He's saying hi to everybody. Is that, that's crazy. I called Brian this morning out of the blue and talked to him for a half hour. That's oh, no kidding. Crazy. Yeah. Hey, he never hey, has time. He's always putting up pictures of being in a studio somewhere. Yeah, he's busy. He's a busy man. He did a very, very high quality, beautiful guitar performance with the new PRS SE Silver Sky. Uh, you should check that out on YouTube. Brian's Amen. demo. Yeah, everybody it's, should be following Brian anyway. He's the, he's the guy there. Absolutely. Following him for a long time. All right, so let's look at some questions here. Uh, we, 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 somebody was mentioning it looks like the entire province of Ontario, Canada took the afternoon off so they could be on the stream. It seems like everybody is up there and it's minus 15 or something. Uh, so they're all indoors watching the stream and we appreciate that. Certainly. Uh, 
Kreenar Kilku says he bought his um, Eastman T484 because of my 390 video. You can't blame that shit on me. You guys, you guys try to put that on my door. That's not me. That's not me. That's your stuff. You know, so just kidding. Uh, I'm looking at a question, how to handle feedback without the 335 block of wood. Tom, that is a benefit and a liability. <laughs> you just, you want to keep it in the benefit category and it can be amazing if you just get a little bit of feedback. So I would just make sure your stage volume is low, but, but I would look at that as a benefit. And then if, yeah. it, if it's not working for the particular situation, put it down and pick up something else. But well, that's the great thing about this. It, it, the it, incredible thing to me is that you see the Beatles on tour in 65 or 66, and there they are on stage with hundred watt boxes behind them, you know, super Beatles behind them. And, and they just been getting run over. And, and, and really what it comes down to is they never take their hands off the strings. That well, they're, they're, that's a that's a good point. And the thing is, this thing will be resonant in a right. way that's very pleasurable in that circumstance. And as long as it's not getting away from you, you're in the that's yeah. the you could not be in a better situation. Right. But then if it starts to get away from you, turn the amp down, move to the side. You know, there are solutions. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right. Let's see. I love this. I'm looking at the questions on my, my phone. Fantastic. <laughs> Beatles strip the paint off. Yeah, what I heard now, you guys all, let's see if this is true. Yeah. That somebody did it first. Uh, Lennon did it first. And then Harrison followed because he liked the sound of it. They liked the Well, the sound story, of it. the story yeah. that I read and included in the video was that uh, they went to India with Donovan. And Donovan convinced them that taking the finish off a guitar really opened it up. Yep. And that Harrison did it, and then Lennon did, and then somebody, somebody in the comments on my video, they're like, um, "I think those guys probably didn't do their own sanding. They probably had someone." I'm like, "Okay, I don't know." You know, the thing that I love about the Beatles at that time and stuff is like that story about the Rick. That at first they wanted to sell Paul McCartney a Rick at like at artist pricing, and Paul's like, "Yeah, no thanks. Like, I'm a beat. It's like I, I'm I'm not going to spend the money." Uh, you know, I'm, I'm Paul McCartney's and I don't think it was an attitude. I think it was, I, I, I'm not gonna spend the money. And then the next summer and when they were at the Hollywood bowl, they gave him the guitar, they gave him the bass. And then by then they'd also made him a, a custom one too. So, well, you should, you should be in that category now too, Keith. You should be. In that <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so here it's Matthew saying he, the search for a casino ended with the 64 reissue Gibson 330. What an amazing guitar. I, I, I agree. I think, I think if you, I would go out there and start looking at 330s. Oh, actually don't. Let us look for them first. But yeah, uh, yeah. yeah that, that. The 330, I think is the same guitar. So an early 60s 330. It, it is the same guitar. That. Yeah, it absolutely yeah. is the same guitar. So it says here, Beatles bought all their casinos. I'm guessing this was probably in the $200 range back then. I mean, back then? Uh, that's a good question. I, I should have come across I mean, that. If, but a I, three, if a 335 came out at $335, wouldn't have this been... Uh, well, know, they came out at three hundred thirty-five dollars in nineteen fifty-eight. Okay, so we right? bring bring it forward a bit. Yeah, like maybe in the mid fours, five, probably okay. by the late sixties. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, if no, early sixties, so yeah, you're probably right. Like low twos, yeah, yeah. I mean the low fours, of, yeah. Yeah, 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 crazy, definitely kind yeah. of crazy. I know that. I mean, I did, I did learn the story about Fender was courting the Beatles and they had a meeting with the Beatles and they finally allowed, you know, Don Randall to send all of that brand new gear. Well, Randall actually went over there and took a meeting. So the thing that I didn't include, cause I think it's a little off color and Randall admitted to it openly later in his career was he actually sent someone to England the year before to try to bribe the Beatles to play Fender stuff on stage, like, like with a check in hand and they sent him packing. And so, so he had to fight his way back from that huge faux pas um, and then get a meeting again. And finally, and really they were using them in the studio by then. It really was just, are you gonna play them on stage or not? So Well, and and I wanna talk about something that I, I would not have mentioned in my video cause I like to stay really, really positive, but yeah, I, I, that's why I didn't read, include it. Yeah, writing, reading between the lines and I think everybody can weigh in on this. I think that, that Harrison probably loved the idea of that guitar, but after owning it for a little while, he probably it was probably just too heavy, and I don't know if it sounded good or not. Yeah. But he, he let it go pretty quick, didn't he? The yeah, somebody put it in the comments and went blowing by earlier that he only owned it for about eleven months. So, yeah, it's uh, one of those things that happens to all of us. You get you're excited about something, you get it, and then you realize it just doesn't stick. 
Yeah. Tom Colhane says, uh, do I know the story about Rickenbacker bringing guitars to the Fab Four in New York City in 64? If you go watch my 12 string video, I actually found great stuff about the story. I mean, like when it comes to the Beatles, I, I was kidding around about the anvil. I'll bet that's somewhere. I'll bet somebody wrote that down because the details about that life are just incredible. So what, uh, not only um, do I know that story, but the part of the story that I liked so much was George wasn't feeling well. So he wasn't going to go to the meeting, but the whole meeting was to present him with their brand new 12 string electric. Right. Ah, so right. George is, stays back at the hotel and the guys go across Central Park to the other hotel where they're going to have the meeting. Right. So they're going across. Well, it's the Beatles in New York City. There are tons of pictures from that day, that very day where they're like in a carriage going across the park and they're all there except George. So they take the meeting and the guitar is so cool that they call George and they're like, yeah, you know, do you feel like, oh, Ron, I'll come over now. Yes. So then he gets it. He gets it. He walks across the park, George Harrison by himself. And and then he and he goes to the meeting and then he gets to the 12 string, et cetera. So it's a great story. Yeah, it's a really great story. So I mean, that is why, a great story. That's why I love doing these things. It's so much. Hey, I have, I have one other thing I want to ask you guys about. Um, somebody said the other day that the basement studio uh, is now an Abercrombie and Fitch storage room. <laughs> The basement studio of, of the original Apple Studios. Yeah. It's now a storage room for uh, an Abercrombie store. Mm. True. Mm. Yeah. Westfield 90 is saying true. I mean, that's amazing. The yeah. world, it, it's just, it's, it's just crazy. Yeah. Well, you know, building is a building in those cases, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I'd like to go you, down. You're actually, you know, it's interesting. You're seeing the comments faster than I am on your phone. Well, maybe we've started something then. You know? <laughs> I know I need a, little, need a little iPad over here. In, well, the only kicker the about StreamYard is I can I can display, I can display Tim's quote, right? But I can't I can't write him back, which of course once you're live on the stream, it's not like I'm gonna be responding to people, but I can't do like at Tim and then address him from within StreamYard. That's one step away within a comment thing. So like I said, there's there's a lot of good things about StreamYard. The fact that I can have my good friend Tim here is the best. I love part it. Of all. Yeah, I it's really, it. it's really I, easy. Know, I, and the I, fact that like you were just playing your guitar in your studio there, it sounded it sounded perfect. It's obviously just going into the live mic. It sounded great. Or that I could good. bring, I had to, I didn't have to do anything to just bring your video up. It's sharing it from my screen and the audio was perfect. Like, you know, like, like you sent it to me and, and everybody could hear it just perfect. I didn't have to do anything. All I had to do was share video. It opened a, a, a box and it came up and that was it. And I could just play it behind that timer. So that was really cool. Fantastic. So uh, they don't they don't pay me to say that, folks. Um, anyway, no, these things are these things are amazing. Uh, I should BV's saying um, Georgia Santani restored the Rosewood Telly. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. That's very very cool. Yeah, that is cool. Uh, I should actually probably do a do a clear my conscience moment here and tell everybody or they didn't notice already that I misspelled almost everyone's name in the video. <laughs> Uh, I, I did a massive, I did a 14 hour edit session to finish that video. So the, the audio is a little sketchy and I am the world's most uh, world, worst speller. I'm a little, just enough dyslexic to not, I shouldn't trust myself. And uh, I actually studied Sanskrit in college in my liberal studies program. And I, of all people should know that D-H-A-N-I is how Donnie spells his name because that's a Sanskrit thing. That's a, that's a, went to Indian, then I had a kid thing. So. Well, it's funny. I, I uh, frequently, not frequently, but I regularly misspell something that I do on YouTube and people really react to it. There's There, there are people who just really need to go, oh, I need to let everybody know that this is misspelled. Right. And right. It, you got you to gotta forgive them for doing that. But it, yeah. it, it, it's common. And when you're making that something with that many moving parts and that much stuff in it, yeah. It's easy to misspell a name. Oh yeah, I've absolutely. Done. And and if you're a bad speller like me, then um, then it looks right. You know, I, I glance at it. I'm reading it, even though I'll see it a number of times. Tim will know this from from uh, editing videos. When I finish this edit in a couple of days, if I'll, I'll like go someplace and I'm sitting here quiet, except I'm talking at me for like two days, and I'll go someplace with a friend and they'll ask me a question and I'll answer. And I literally in my head think, does this guy ever shut up? And I'm talking about me. I'm like, <laughs> I'm so sick of listening to my own voice. You know, that whole thing. Yeah. Um, so it's very Yeah, funny. It, that, that is the truth. I look at some of my old videos from a year ago and I'm, I'm my, my uh, 
my actually demeanor is a little too caffeinated in some of them and i can't it's like oh no, no, no <laughs> like no, this no, right no. now <laughs> no no it's like i edited all all morning actually and, we're, and i'm closing on a house and i was juggling you know stuff with the bank by email while in between editing and uh, so um tom Colhain says i need a proofreader i i have a proofreader for the scripts but that doesn't save me when i'm actually uh putting stuff on screen tom because no one proofs it before it goes out. I'll watch it a lots and lots of times. Uh, oh, John says, uh, JL Trump, John says that Delaney Bramlett added a humbucker in the neck, which is why it needed wow. to be restored. Interesting. Wow. I'd love to get one of those old ones in my hands just to feel the weight of it. And, you know, well, I, I, I mean, it's funny. I, I bet, I bet they just don't sound that great. The old, old those ones. First, so apologies first, to anybody who might own one of them, but the first run and, there. And yeah. they're, they're about five or six grand, uh, you know, or, are they the, yeah the right 60s now. ones the early 70s but uh this this chambered one with the uh, it's like an open pour finish which i love it, it's yeah. it's a it, it really is now wonderful. now the next rosewood as well that must feel great yeah 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 it's great have you been playing it enough so it's starting to get shiny like on my on my strand not enough no no on my strandbergs that's that's an oil finished neck that oh. has you you would think that it's finished now because I've played it so much. It's just, it's just, and it's um, uh, baked. What do they say? Torfied. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Roasted. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And, and, and me, does, I went to college in the like, 70s. I should know what roasted means. So it, roasted. it doesn't, it doesn't look shiny. So it's a, it's a pleasurable. Yeah. Oh, it's, a, it feels so kind good. Of velvet. Yeah. You've turned it into velvet, you know. Yeah. And this cool. is a, and that's a Palfero fingerboard, but it's the darkest one I've ever seen really nice anyway yeah. oh i want to i want to answer a question about my marshals the two marshals behind me uh oh, you mean the park forgive me for okay so so when i go where are they where are they oh god <laughs> why can't i see them They're, are they on. right behind you they're like behind your head now there yeah, you go yeah, yeah we're not getting seasick so, we're good you can see those okay so I now have four plexi marshals i had two that i bought when they were cheap i bought them like in the late 90s early 2000s and they're okay but one of these the bottom one i bought recently from a friend of mine who had a marshall stack that he kept for 50 years now the significance wow. of that and the, wow. the joy and pleasure of knowing somebody he was in a band in the 80s and we we knocked around la together in the 80s he moved to northern california he kept his marshall stack for 50 years i have photos of the original buyers he bought it in 70 the original kids had it in, in 1968 so I just received this super tremolo head and a full stack uh, that my friend owned for 50 years. We negotiated for like six weeks. I paid the right price for it. It was so satisfying. So that's right. the one on the bottom and it sounds phenomenal. It's wow. A plus, A plus. Now the, the one on the top, which is a fit PA head, I did Paul Reed Smith's school last August and part of my compensation was he gave me this head because <laughs> I brought a lot of ticket sales to the, the event yeah. and, and Paul, Eric Johnson and Paul actually traded this back and forth and made it sound amazing. There's one channel in this PA head, and it's from 1967. So here is a 1968 Plexi Super Tremolo, and here's a 1967 uh, Marshall PA head, 100 watt, essentially the same amp. You know, yeah. they're they're out there, and and if you're you're interested, one channel in particular. There's four channels, one channel in particular, and that's probably the one they worked on this was this was eric johnson's amp for a little while yeah. so lucky to uh, have it that's the story drop, i want to drop back bv answered a question as i knew he would help us out here sam stamos hey sam uh wanted to know sort of general weights of a 335 versus like a, a casino or a 330 and he says 335 probably seven to seven i've seen i've seen 335s up over eight pretty regularly as well um and then the casinos I, i'd say that's all spot on the i used to own a um a 339 at the same time that I owned that 330. My 339 was nice and late, light at about seven and a quarter pounds, but that guitar weighs five and a quarter pounds. And it's balanced. It's not neck heavy. It's not any of those things. It has kind of a narrow neck for me, um, but it has that 60s neck. But um, what do you think you got there, Tim? Six pounds. Six pounds, yeah. It's I'm not light surprised. as a feather. I mean, yeah. it's light as a feather. So much fun to have on your lap. That's all there is oh. to it. Yeah, that's oh. great. Yeah. Uh, 12 foot chain says there's a 1971 Rosa Telly on reverb right now for a measly 23,500 with Bisbee, Bigsby. So I wonder if it's a factory Bigsby. 
I you don't know, know that. But, yeah, for I, I, yeah. <laughs> I don't think any of us need that one. I hate yeah, to say. I don't think so. Oh, there's Declan McMullen. Declan from uh, from Dublin uh, says he tuned in the PRS school last two years. Tim was awesome both years. Oh, thank Tim you. is always awesome, and I'm sure thank he was awesome for PRS as well. Um, thank you. It's, it's I'm learning on the job with that kind of thing. Getting you know the the, the first. The first year we did it, I did it from here, uh, and I actually pre-recorded it. But last August, I went there and sat on a stage and did it live, and that was very nerve-wracking. But I needed to, I needed to get it done. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm new at teaching in front of people. Well, and it wasn't in front of people. That's what was nerve-wracking. It was in front of 800 camera. people virtually right. with the cameraman in front of me. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I, it's it's like um, my family says to me, you know, do you get nervous during the live stream? But like, I get nervous starting a live stream. Once I'm doing the stream, it's yeah. all going by too fast. It, honestly, when I when I stop the stream and it tells me how many people were on during the hour, then it kind of wigs me out. Because I used to do a lot of talks at conferences and stuff where it'd be like maybe maybe 500 people in a room. That was pretty regular yeah. sort of fair for my yeah. old administrative job, but not not 4000 people like we might get in a stream sometimes. Uh, Tim, there was a question here for you. Paul Need says you need Paul to give you one of the Hendrix heads. Wish I could follow. I have lesson. one. Oh, I you have, have one. one. There and you go. I did. I, I did a, a Sweetwater presentation of the 50 watt Hendrix head uh, for the virtual Nam, and I have the 50 watt here. And I have to tell you, it's phenomenal. I would love to try the 100 watt, but they made. Paul's been trying to do this for years. Right. And this is. This is not an easy thing. He didn't do this easily. He's made amps for years to try and reach this level. Yeah. And the new Hendrix amp, they got there. And it's even noisy. You know, the, the, the noise floor on these old plexis is really high. Yeah. His, the, his plexi, is, the noise floor is high. It has the same kind of breakup. I vouch for it. Uh, it it's a 50 watt. I have it sitting here. It's, I, I would, I, he tells me that the 100 watt, he likes the 100 watt better. That's another, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And well, why did you bring me the 50 watt? You you know gave John yeah. Mayer the 100 watt. Gee, all the other 100 watt. Right. Uh -huh. So I do you know you know with with a company like that you you know you have to you know they they're, they're so far behind in production that you know you just oh have everybody to, yeah everybody. Um, but, I did, but I, 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 you would love anybody who's a plexi lover, old Marshall lover. Paul finally got there. It wasn't easy. I mean, he's been trying this for a decade and yeah. And he's yeah. probably, I, he may have spent a half a million dollars in development getting to this place. Yeah. Mark Terry, um, yeah. in the video where he made it talking about putting his guitar out, he said he knew that, um, he knew that Paul was his kind of guy because they were sitting there talking about guitar specs. And out of nowhere, apropos of nothing that was being talked about, he's like, oh, wait, you need to hear this amplifier. He's like, what? You need to hear this amplifier. I, I think I got it right. Come on. And they went downstairs to this like underground studio, turned the thing way the hell up. And, and he says, it was incredible. And they geeked out on amps for two hours. And then they went back to the business meeting they were having before. He's like, that's how I knew Paul was a guy I wanted to work with. So, well, and, you, and you're funny because you said it's funny because I know I know some people at PRS and you, and you always say to me, I only know Paul. I just it's know true. Paul. I only know Paul. I, I only know Paul. <laughs> I, let me tell one really quick story that, that blew me away because I was so proud of Paul when he came out with the John Mayer guitar. And I thought, you know, Paul is relentless in his pursuit of everything. And I thought, you know, he probably went over to John's house and broke down the door or, or right. you know, yep. probably went to a concert and, and walked up on stage. and just Endlessly, heard yeah. I mean, Paul is relentless. So what Brian Ewald tells me. Yeah, oh, okay. Is Brian is still John here. Mayer calls PRS the general number <laughs> and says, hey, it's John Mayer. Uh, you know, I'm interested in, you know. Right. Kind of creating a signature guitar, and of course, that's great. They didn't even, it's the classical thing. So sure. finally, after like like two or three more times, yeah. they they go, I wonder if it's John Mayer, and it was John Mayer. This <laughs> it all was initiated by John Mayer, which made me so happy for Paul. Yeah, that's so because great. he re literally will he'll lift lift heaven and earth to try and keep you know his employees paid and his yeah. business on track. You know, he had a really really. Yeah. lean time around 2008 and and he brought it all back by with brute force and you know just yeah. heavy lifting and for yeah, john Mayer, a, actually have cold called the company general number and started this thing that's a great story amazes me yeah well i i actually used to own a 2009 the first year of the dgts 
And I, it's, and it's, you know, do people ask me, you know, cause I sell guitars and do I regret that? That's one that it's hard to find another one. Um, and the thing that I was going to say was the thing that Paul did in 2008 and 2009, the amazing thing to me is he kept the staff on and lowered production. So there's sort of an undercurrent thing about 2008, 2009, 2010 PRS guitars. They just had a lot more time to spend on each guitar. Amazing. I didn't so if you think about it that way, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's kind of like there's a moment in Gibson history during World War II where they moved 90% of the production staff over to the war effort. But of course, they kept only the top, top, top builders building guitars. So they only had 10% of the people they usually had to build guitars from like 42 to 47. But during that time, the the guys the guys were building them. Now, unfortunately, the materials available kept collapsing. You know, like the, the guitars got cheesier and they they were they ran out of rosewood and you know. But these were the know. best of the best guys to either build. I don't want to miss. I had a top chat here. I don't want to miss this. Anthony Mezzached says, do guitars get lighter as they age and wood dries? They do. They absolutely do. Um, I used to own a uh, guitar that was a copy of an O45. It was a Washburn copy. It was over 100 years old. It was a Brazilian rosewood, little parlor guitar. It actually was the first guitar I ever owned. My father and I went halves on it because, of course, I wanted an electric guitar. Uh, I think I've told the story on, um, on the video about when to buy and sell. I ended up selling it to a really good friend, um, but that guitar weighed nothing. I also used to own a 1956 Velasquez classical guitar, again, Brazilian rosewood, et cetera, from when I played classical during college. Um, that guitar also weighed, his, his guitars were famously light. Um, that's the same kind of, um, when I was selling that Velasquez, actually the dealer in New York, uh, Beverly Mayer, uh, told me that she had sold one to Keith Richards, same year, same maker, and had wow. sold one to Paul Simon. Same year, same maker. So, wow. so yeah, they, they do get lighter. Um, but, you know, but guitars, Tim will be able to talk better at this. Guitars that just are pristine and sit in the case, um, guitars need to be played. They absolutely need to be played. If, if a guitar is not getting played, if it's not vibrating and it's just sitting, it's going to need some time to kind of open up again. I, I don't know if you've run into this, Tim. This is sort of something that a lot of people talk about in acoustic guitars. I don't know how much it might or might not be true with electric guitars. It is true. I mean, it, I think it takes about a year for them to begin to open up. Uh, an electric guitar sat, can sound great, the, you know, just weeks after manufacture. But yes, it, and I, it actually has to do with, I think, the, the wood continuing to dry and right. then just vibration, you know, movement and vibration and everything and everything settling in and getting, uh, getting more connected. You know, it's, you yeah. know, it sounds like voodoo but it's true i mean by the same token i have done the test between a 59 les paul and a 59 reissue uh and them sounding kind of identical so there's a point where right if if you have a good guitar that's a faithful reissue mm -hmm. it really sounds often sounds in the same world as the original so yeah it, it feels like for the last 10 years we've been saying that everything that we're in the golden age right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's absolutely true, whether it's pickups or, you know, what yeah. Paul's done with the, is it TCI, TCM? TCI. True. I mean, every, yeah, with, with, There's with humbuckers, incredible. everybody, yeah, everybody has chased, I'm sorry to interrupt no. you, Keith. No, no, no. Everybody has chased the PAF sound relentlessly for the last decade. And I think everybody is there. You know, if you get yeah. like a Thornbucker by Pete Thorne or a Lawler or yeah. Paul's TCI pickups, or I have other, you know, uh, Ron Ellis, everybody has chased this thing, and and it's almost like everybody got there. Like they're yeah. every all the humbuckers now are bell like, open, low output, right. wonderful things. You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. somebody asked about the difference between this and a three thirty five, and to me, the main difference, of course, there's the, the fully the, hollow, yeah. fully hollow. So that adds a particular character, but it's the pickups. That's the entire show. I mean, P nineties, you know, they're some people consider it the greatest pickup ever made because it's it's kind of like a strat pickup but it's a little fuller maybe a little sweeter a little more a little more body to it it's like a pair of really really nice open fat single coils yeah and then, then humbuckers Ry Cooter had this comment where he said the humbucking pickup was the end of tone with the guitar because the pickups that Ry likes are basically the cheapest just things that just 
they just drop on the front. Then you know, it's like, like laying on the face of the guitar, laying on the face of the guitar. But they're like microphones; you can like talk through them. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's his idea because they're very open. They're noisy as heck, but they're right. very open sounding. So, I love humbuckers uh, because I grew up listening to them. I grew up listening yeah. to Clapton and Peter Frampton right. and Billy Gibbons. So it's in my DNA. I enjoy the sound of a humbucker. But somebody like Rye, coming from a, a little earlier period, you know, yeah. He, he likes so anyway you, you know what's weird is uh so those i mentioned it earlier the jumbos that george and john bought the 160e that guitar actually was released in 1950 and they were trying to jump on the bandwagon of putting out electric guitars and they they hadn't you know pulled their stuff together at um uh at gibson to, they were you know they were hadn't even launched the um the les paul project was probably on the on the drawing room the that you know there's a little thin pickup that you see that just the poles at the end of the fingerboard on those guitars and then there's a volume and tone like right on the face of the guitar it's a p90 i didn't know that i didn't either if you think about wow. the timeline though that guitar came out in 1950 it's got to be a p90 because the fact is and that's what the book i'm using uh gibson's flat top guitars uh that's my reference dan erline probably is where that came from um and you know 57 is humbuckers 1950 they bought their guitars in 62 so i think we all assumed it was some weird narrow single coil it's a p90 and maybe by then it had changed but when they came out it was a p90 i, I, I oh man I, that's yeah. so great to Very learn cool. it's so great to know yeah. i i, I want to just talk about one more thing before we move on or i'll probably sign off in about we're almost minutes. running out of time it's 4 oh, great. what do you do an so hour? Much fun. yeah you do an, an hour it? yep i do an hour okay yep. cool okay so this film get back the, it was uncomfortable for me also because I think all of us have been in bands where we're trying to work stuff up and work stuff out. And some egos are stronger. Some people are more talented at some of the, the you know, singing and playing. And it was, it was, it was really hard to see uh, people not be, not be able to express their ideas or certain ideas. You know, in my video, I said, well, the best idea wins, you know? Right. And some, I got a comment going, no, it doesn't, you know, you know, it's it's ego you know the best ego wins and i went you know he's kind of right i was being a little pollyanna-ish about saying that it was i think uh, i talked to musician friends it was uncomfortable for those of us who've been in bands to watch that process because it's it's it is it is hard and but you're right the minute the song starts playing you go yeah. wtf this is <laughs> right well, and, and at the same time, like they, they just they just walk through long and winding road where he's doing like this faux operatic thing. And you're like, get on with it. Get to work. You know, you're in my head. That's what I hear. You know, that that's me. That's my OCD thing going there. But but then, of course, they do. They flip the switch and now we're doing it for real. And and, it, and it's a testament to how much music they had all played together. Yeah, that, right. that they they knew the moment this was the straight up take. And when this was what this was the one that's going to go on the record, they could feel it immediately. I, I'm absolutely convinced. And I don't well, I don't, and, and I tend to think that we're all the same to the greatest yeah. extent. Um, but the reality is, boy, uh, th they put in the hours. They they did their um, their 10,000. That's for sure. I, I got to do something in the spring. Don was called me up uh, in March uh, wow. last year. And he said, hey, uh, you want to go over to Bob Dylan's and run some songs? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, oh, 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 okay, <laughs> and he said, "Yeah, you, me, and Greg Lee's are going to go over there." And I'm sitting, thinking to myself, three of us? That, that's a four piece. What? Well, so I what? It is, Greg, I, I apologize. Like, I don't. I don't know Greg Lee's. I know uh, how he's a, he is a he's a multi instrumental uh, dobro lap steel guitar right? genius. And, yeah, and I think of he's Don on the road as a producer and like bass player, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah Don, and Don. So. The reason I got the call is because I had done uh, uh, records with Don was two Neil Diamond records not too long ago, one a wow. Christmas record, one an artist record, and he he made me the the timekeeper on acoustic guitar. He likes the he liked my time and my feel on the acoustic guitar, so he thought, okay, who's going to play the simple Bob Dylan parts from the early '60s, mm -hmm. whatever, and and because that's what we were doing, we were doing new versions of his songs. So um, cut to the chase, I went down to Santa Monica 18 times and recorded 30 songs in a circle with Bob Dylan. Don was Greg Lee's and then T-Bone Burnett showed up for some of it too. <laughs> what I'm leading to here is like, I was the guy in the room who who said nothing. 
right. then John would say a few things, and T Bone's really gregarious, and they he's got a relationship with Bob, so he said a lot. Right, right. So it was that same situation where you're in this high level situation. We sat in a circle, we got COVID tested, mm -hmm. and we cut it all live. Uh, and it, it was, I was, I was like Ringo in in the Beatles movie. I said, yeah. okay. Well, you know, I, I love it when you hear story. I love it that like the it's story that people are these gigantic names and it's and they certainly have ego and they have investment. I was at a Bonnie Raitt concert years ago and it was right after she came out a bunch of years ago now. And she had just come out with a record where she actually did two Bob Dylan covers on it. And um, and and after she was out, she's out on the road someplace and uh, she called Bob and she said, hey, Bob, did you hear my new record? And he's like, he's like, yeah. And she's like, well, what would you think of my version? And he goes, um, I liked it. What'd you think of my version? And he's like, <laughs> my villain is asking Bonnie Ray, you know, well, that's cool. I'm glad you recorded my song, but uh, what about my version of the song, you know? And it's, yeah, like, it was amazing. He and so he, uh, Don is Don and Greg have been playing with Bob Ware. And one day Bob Dylan walked in and said, Hey, <laughs> said, Hey Don, I, I wrote another verse to this, that song you guys are doing. <laughs> oh, here, here. <laughs> oh, that is hysterical. Because, of course, he, he's famous for, you know, singing a song live and just doing verses that no one's ever heard before. Oh, no, he's constantly. I watched him rewrite. I saw the gift in action. I watched him rewrite lyrics in front of us. Yep. And it's it's uh, an otherworldly gift. Yeah. You know, I had an just... amazing high school teacher um, and who, who ran like this program at my high school. And he took some of us to our first rock concert. And it was the Rolling Thunder Review in 1976. And so it was Country Joe McDonald and the Fish, Joni Mitchell. Um, on, on the part of the tour I saw, Joan Baez, of course, was with him and, um, and Bob Dylan. And Bob Dylan wore famously this flat hat and he wore white makeup and a vest and, a, and like a blousy sleeve shirt. And the next night in Buffalo, um, he was doing a song and Joan Baez had dressed up as him. Would put the white makeup, the flat hat, and came out on stage and just came up to the microphone and started singing next to him. And he was like, you know, that's <laughs> like that. And that was the first concert I ever saw was a Bob Dylan concert. Oh, so, man. Yeah, yeah. He, he's yeah. definitely, he likes to, he likes to just make everybody crazy with being unpredictable and stuff. So. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway, this was I, an amazing thing. Yeah, we had fun. Uh, John Cordy is here. I mentioned you earlier, Jonathan. You totally missed it. You, you missed your moment in the sun here. Uh, to the extent that there's any sun in upstate New York anymore. Uh, and uh, I need to thank Baby Ninja and I need to thank Tim. Tim, I think this is the, that was the nicest 15 minutes I've ever spent. Yeah, uh, what happened? I was going to say, well, I can come for 15 minutes. And it's like, like oh, I, I, give you, yeah, I don't know much about this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like I know that when I did the New Year's Eve thing with Rick, I was on, I was supposed to come on for like a half an hour and I was, he was late bringing me in. And then he kept me there for two hours. And then you basically, you carried it home. You carried the ball. You were there for two hours after me. Well, I, I, I had like 13 minutes to get down and see the, the ball drop in New York City. I had family downstairs and they were going to be mad at me. So I was, I was on for an hour and 43 minutes. And I said, <laughs> Rick, I, it's almost midnight in New York right now. Said, yeah, I'm only on for 18 more minutes. I got to go hang with my family. I'm going to be really mad. He so, was yeah, alone. Was he was alone at the end. <laughs> Poor boy, poor boy. Anyway. Poor guy. All right. Well, thanks All again, right. everybody. Um, thanks, and, everybody. Uh, if, if you need to reach, uh, the links are in the comment section. Um, the links for Tim's channel are there, uh, and my stuff is there. The stores are there. And uh, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't subbed to the channels already. And uh, really appreciate it. And uh, I'll, I'll talk to everybody soon. And uh, I'll, uh, the new video is coming out at the end of the week. Thanks again, Tim. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye -bye. Take care, everybody. I'll see you next week. Well, I'll see you when you see the next video.